in general of global climate change, how plants react to that, issues, how they reallocate photosynthesis. We had a, a fun, nerdy chat over supper about uh, instantaneous photosynthetic rates and how to measure them, and what that does to plants, and how plants can reallocate photosynthesis for uh, reproduction or not. Because the other work she does is on, uh, in part on ragweed, um, among her many projects, and uh, ragweed and how the, the influence of increases in CO2 is uh, fleck, affecting pollen. So uh, we can think about how climate change is increasing some of the diseases that we, we might get from being outdoors from ticks, but also diseases and sneezes that we might get from that. But it's a really important topic tonight. Garlic mustard has a huge influence, especially where I'm from in the upper Midwest, where there's just massive uh, outbreaks going back 20 or so years in garlic mustard and tremendous amounts of energy has been expended trying to reduce those. But the question always remains, which we hope uh, Christine will address tonight, uh, on what happens to those plots, to those forest soils. How do they recover? What's the best way to influence restoration that might go on in those situations? Um, so she um, lives and works at UMass Amherst and I learned has an 11-year-old son, so I'm sure she has a lot of busyness in her life besides just uh, teaching and researching uh, and, and the like. And so would like to have Dr. Stitzett come to the stage and inform us about this important topic. Thanks so much for inviting me. It's really nice to be here this evening um, and to talk with all of you. And the star of tonight's show is this little plant called Aliaria pediolata or garlic mustard, which in its home range of Eurasia is known as Jack by the Hedge, which really speaks to its natural history. It's a species in its home range that is restricted to edgy habitat, hedgerows, trails, roadsides, things like that. And garlic mustard has been introduced into North America where it has actually become a, a problematic species in the forest understory. And garlic mustard is a biennial. Um, producing seeds, seedlings in the first year that um, then become rosettes. And from the rosette stage, they overwinter and become reproductive adults in their second summer. And the introduction of garlic mustard in North America has resulted in its expansion into northeastern forests and habitats, raising concerns about impacts on the native biodiversity. And so here's just a couple of examples of the species that we know and love in our own northeastern forest habitats. What happens when garlic mustard gets into the forest understory can be fairly dramatic. It can uh, produce these monoculture stands of vast sea of garlic mustard in the understory, which seems to prohibit the growth of native understory species. And as a result, this has become a major focus of land managers from um, everything from NGOs to state officials trying to do something about this garlic mustard problem, trying to eradicate garlic mustard. And it really has been um, on the radar of land managers since the 1980s, but continues to be a problem today. Um, however, most of this work is being done in a sort of ad hoc way, and there's only anecdotal evidence about how well the removal of garlic mustard is working, both to reduce the densities of garlic mustard and the impacts that it has on, na on native ecosystems. So what I'm going to do tonight is summarize um, over a decade of research on this little plant, um, focused on the ecology and impacts of this species, and then hopefully make some comments about management recommendations that have come out of this research, um, and to suggest some future research directions that we are interested in in my lab. And I'm going to start with a little introduction about some of the first things that we noticed about garlic mustard, and that will really set the stage for some of the more recent work. So one of the first things that we noticed about garlic mustard over a decade ago now is that in the presence of garlic mustard, as the density of these plants increases, you see an, a decrease in the densities of tree seedlings. So these are um, tree seedlings that represent the future forest canopy 
And of course, this raises some concerns about what this means for the future of our forests. And given that these species do represent the future, it has raised a number of concerns and, and basic research questions. So when we look at the forest, we tend to notice the spectacular above ground um, aspects of forest ecosystems, such as this beautiful ball scene here. But it's important to take a moment and remember that forest tree species have a lot going on underground. And um, forest plants, especially the seedlings of key canopy tree species, are highly dependent on mycorrhizal fungi. These are symbiotic fungi that live on and in the roots of these tree seedlings. And you can see, I, I don't, I guess I do have a pointer, okay. You can see here, what happens when you grow tree seedlings without mycorrhizae, so this is tree seedlings that have been grown in sterilized soil, compared to seedlings that are of the same age that have been grown with their mycorrhizal symbionts. So these are really, really important symbioses that are happening below ground that affect forest structure and the growth of these, um, of these canopy trees. Here's the sort of textbook um, figure that explains exactly what mycorrhizal fungi are. So these are root symbionts that exchange carbohydrate for nutrients and water. They effectively are expanding the root system of the plants that they associate with. And they fall into two broad categories. There are thousands and thousands of taxa of these mycorrhizal fungi, but they fall into the two groups, the ectomycorrhizae, which live on the outside of the roots and form a sheath around the, um, the outside of the root system, and the arbuscular mycorrhizae, which actually integrate themselves into the cellular structure of the roots. But both of these types of mycorrhizae extend the root network insofar as allowing the plants to um, take up patchy resources in the soil, such as nutrients and water, in exchange for the carbohydrate that is being produced by these photosynthetic organisms. So as a member of the Brassicaceae, garlic mustard has a unique suite of phytochemicals known as glucosinolates, and also um, contains flavonoids, both of which are known to have um, specific um, impacts, including um, being antimicrobial and having anti-herbivore or defense um, mechanisms. And the Brassicaceae, of course, represent, um, are, the Brassicaceae are a number of very familiar species. So we have food species, but if you've ever, if you like to eat sushi and you've ever taken a bite of wasabi, you know that the glucosinolates and the flavonoids contained in these plants can be very powerful. And so um, we know that this phytochemistry has an important ecological role. And this led to the hypothesis that garlic mustard might be disrupting tree seedling interactions with mycorrhizal fungi because the antimicrobial properties of the glucosinolates are thought to be antifungal, um, as well as having these other impacts on species interactions. So this led to this hypothesis known as the novel weapons hypothesis, where we predicted that we would see suppression of the symbiosis between mycorrhizal fungi and tree seedlings in the presence of extract of garlic mustard. And so in this experiment, we we exposed three key species, the seedlings of three key canopy species, Acer saccharum or sugar maple, Acer rubrum, and Fraxinus americana, to the extracts of garlic mustard as well as the extracts of one another in an experimental um, design within a greenhouse. And the results from this experiment were remarkably clear. You can see that when you grow these tree seedlings in the presence of garlic mustard extract, they have no colonization on their roots by mycorrhizae at all. And this results in very low growth of all three of these different species. And when you compare that to the normal growth that they um, show and the normal mycorrhizal colonization rates that they show when they are grown in the presence of the native extracts, it's just remarkable evidence that there's some phytochemical suppression of this, my, of this mycorrhizal symbiosis going on. We also um, exposed the um, spores of Glomus and Aculospora, which are two of the taxa that are in that are mycorrhizal fungi, to garlic mustard extract as well as the extract of the other species, and we showed that there was no germination of these spores in the presence of garlic mustard. So this was very clear evidence that there is this impact of this invasive plant on interactions between native tree seedlings and their mycorrhizal symbionts. <coughs> 
But since these types of biotic interactions range from what we call facultative to obligate, in other words, a species can benefit from interacting with mycorrhizal fungi, but doesn't really need them, all the way to an obligate state where um, a species really needs that symbiosis in order to, um, to grow, we made the prediction that some species might be less impacted by garlic mustard than others. And so we grew a suite of species along a mycorrhizal dependency axis of variation showing here from low levels of mycorrhizal dependency to high levels of mycorrhizal dependency. In other words, how well does this plant grow with and without mycorrhizae? And looked at the effect of garlic mustard on the y-axis here. This is showing the, the amount of reduction in plant growth in the presence of garlic mustard. So the higher up we are on this axis, the bigger impact garlic mustard is having on the growth of these plants. And you can see what happens here is that the weedy annuals sort themselves out down on the low end of the graph, showing that there's really not that much impact of garlic mustard on these species that are not very dependent on mycorrhizae. But woody plants, like the tree seedlings that we studied in the previous graph, and some of the shrubs and perennials are affected more. So this is also an indication that not only is garlic mustard having differential impacts on different species, but may have some implications for the trajectory of plant succession and the way that plants assemble themselves after a biological invasion like this. And as a follow-up study, we also found that garlic mustard reduces associations not only between arbuscular mycorrhizae in the species that I showed you earlier, but also species like pines and oaks that rely on the ectomycorrhizal types of fungi. So you see here with garlic mustard, there is a reduction in the um, abundance of these ectomycorrhizal fungi on the root tips of these particular types of species, and that that occurs in a number of different forest types. So this earlier work then led to a number of new research directions that have been the focus of my research program, funded by a number of different organizations, but really focused on these three main questions. How does garlic mustard spread into the understory where we now know it is having this impact on understory plant species? How do these soil and plant communities respond to garlic mustard invasion overall, not just the couple of um, species that we were able to look at individually, but overall as a community? And then finally, is restoration possible and on what time frame if we are successful at removing garlic mustard. And the approach that I've been taking to this is to do some long-term demographic studies, as well as to do some genomics work, looking at the soil biota and using bioinformatics to determine what um, fungal communities are there and how the fungal communities in the soil are responding to garlic mustard, as well as looking at plant community responses above ground. And I'll just acknowledge here that this is a largely collaborative work, and this is my current research team, but there are a, a large number of people who have contributed to all of the work that I'm about to show you. So the rest of the talk will focus on this ongoing new research with an emphasis on this first part here, the effects of a large-scale eradication experiment that we've had an opportunity to do. But I'll also touch on long-term observations of the invasion process in this species, and um, to some extent, invasion interactions with global change, so what we know about what garlic mustard might do under warming and other global change scenarios. So one of the most exciting things that we were able to do in um, our current and current work was to undertake cross-site eradications in cooperation with a number of landowner stakeholders who are interested in collaborating with us to do experimental garlic mustard eradications. So I mentioned earlier that to a large extent, garlic mustard eradications are being done in an ad hoc kind of way. We were able to get together with landowners and, and ask them if they would be willing to do garlic mustard eradications in the exact same way as a bunch of other people doing eradications around the region. So here's Massachusetts, and this is where our sites are. We had a number of sites where everybody was pulling out garlic mustard removal by hand, which is the most common method that people use at all of the sites, shown in orange. 
And then at the sites shown in yellow, we also had a spraying treatment because some of those landowner stakeholder uh, managers were interested in spraying as a potential management technique as well. So we were able to do this very unique thing, which was to co cooperate with land managers to do this large-scale experiment to determine what are some of the effects of garlic mustard and whether eradications have, um, are, have an effectiveness at this sort of broad geographic scale. So we did this big eradication experiment. And just zooming in a little bit on what that experiment looked like, there were three large plots per site in garlic mustard invaded areas. We had areas that were invaded that we just left alone but marked off and surveyed. We had areas where we did hand pulling and we had areas where we sprayed. And there were three of those, three replicates of these at each of those sites that I just showed you. And all of these were then um, compared to uninvaded reference sites. We then followed these plots for several years, doing not only surveys of garlic mustard density, but also above ground surveys of the plant communities. And at certain points in time along this timeline, we also collected soil, and we took those, so those soil samples um, and sent them out for genomics analysis, and were able to analyze what the entire fungal community looked like in response to these different treatments. So one key result from this experiment is that pulling is definitely more effective than spraying at reducing garlic mustard densities. Shown here is just adult densities of garlic mustard throughout the time scale of this particular experiment. You can see that the invaded, um, the invaded patches are shown in red, the pulled patches are shown in green, and the sprayed patches are shown in blue. And what you can see is that every um, green dot is lower than the others, except for in 2014 when we first got started. Um, but that the spraying has more erratic responses in terms of garlic mustard density. So um, we also just um, point out that reduced adult densities of garlic mustard also means that there's lower seed production. And lowering that seed production reduces the propagule pressure in the future, so it can also have implications for future garlic mustard densities. So we do we are able to say that we recommend pulling over spraying from the results of that work. Then I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the fungal community responses to the eradications or, and to the invasion by garlic mustard. So shown here are some of the major players in forest understories in terms of the fungal community. So shown in purple are the saprotrophs. These are the decomposer fungi. And the fruiting bodies of these decomposer fungi are the ones that have purple labels, such as the lycoperidon and the sterium. Um, we have pathogenic or parasitic types of fungi, such as amylaria and the latiporus. And then we also have mycorrhizal fungi, the fruiting bodies of the mycorrhizal fungi, such as the rustula, shown up in the upper right. And the first major result from this investigation comes from a simple comparison of the fungal taxa in uninvaded reference plots and invaded areas from these study sites that I just showed you on the map. And the first thing that you'll notice is that the mycorrhizal fungi are um, in much lower relative abundances in the invaded areas than in the uninvaded areas. And this is, the axis are not, is not shown here, but this is for organic soil and this is for the mineral soil. So this is basically just two different layers of the soil. We got the same result. The, um, the mycorrhizal fungi are reduced in the presence of garlic mustard. Not surprising, but we were able to show that in the whole soil fungal community, the mycorrhizae are being suppressed. And then surprisingly and very interestingly, we found the reverse was true for the pathogenic types of fungi, where we have much higher abundances of pathotropes in invaded versus uninvaded patches in both of those different soil layers. So the key point here is that garlic mustard invaded soils are depleted in mycorrhizal fungi overall at the whole community level, and they are enriched in these pathogenic types of taxa. OK, 
Okay, so um, so Rostula were the dominant fungi in these New England forests, but these were the taxa that were most sensitive to the garlic mustard invasion. So now I'm talking sort of at the taxonomic level, not the functional group level. And the Amanita were less common, but they became the dominant mycorrhizal fungi with invasion. And then these Amanita were accompanied by these new pathogens and parasites that do not occur in the reference sites at all. So what happens when we eradicate garlic mustard to these fungal groups? So let's look at this first in terms of these functional groups again. The EMF is the ectomycorrhizal fungi, the saprotrophs, and the parasitic group. So you see in the light blue, this is what it looks like in uninvaded reference plots and the invaded plots. And then when we eradicated garlic mustard, Interestingly, in the uh, mycorrhizal group, we saw an increase right away within the first year, and that was maintained in the, in the third year of observation. And then for the saprotrophs, we see some change, but that took three years. And then the pathotrophs also returned to the reference levels in the first year and maintained that difference in the third year. Now you might also notice if you're looking at this graph long enough that the invaded plots also showed some decline in year three. And we actually, we actually think that we did too good of a job at reducing garlic mustard densities in our eradication treatments. And because of the lower propagule pressure, we had lower densities of garlic mustard in year three, even in our invaded plots. So that may have something to do with why we're seeing recovery in the invaded plots as well as in the eradicated plots in terms of the overall fung fungal groups. However, even though we see some recovery in terms of functional groups, the taxa, the individual taxa within those functional groups remained distinct between the invaded and the uninvaded plots. So the eradicated and invaded communities of fungi were dominated by Opinium brassica, Mortarellara and Amanita, whereas Rushla and the Cenococcum were the dominant species in the uninvaded reference plots. So we saw some, um, so a, a change in the community structure that was sustained um, at, this, at this taxonomic level in response to garlic mustard, regardless of the eradications. So that means really that garlic mustard is changing the trajectory of, of the community structure in these fungal communities. And in addition to that, we also see that there is some sustained alteration to physical and chemical properties in the soil. So shown in this graph is just carbon stocks. It's something that people are talking a lot about these days in terms of climate change. This is just the amount of carbon that is stored in the soil in the uninvaded reference plots. You can see that it's higher than it is in the invaded plots. And when we do the eradications, you see some increase, but it's not a significant increase which means that the carbon stocks are not recovering back to the baseline levels of the reference areas. And the same was true for pH and for nutrient concentration. So another aspect of the soil biota that we investigated kind of by accident, um, because we stumbled on a lot of earthworms as we were doing our soil sampling, was to look at the responses of non-native earthworms to the experimental eradications. So, I'll just pause here for a minute and, and remind everyone in the room that most of the earthworms that we see in North America are non-native earthworms. And in particular, above this line, which represents where um, last native earthworms were seen since the last glaciation. So in the Northeast, where we are here, all of the earthworms in the soil are non-native earthworms. And there has been some um, evidence in the literature that non-native earthworms are associated <coughs> with biological invasion by plant species. And the idea behind this correlation, this broad scale correlation, is that the earthworms are acting as these ecosystem engineers, they're churning up the soil, they're doing all kinds of disturbance and sort of paving the way for invasive plants to come in. But what we found was actually evidence to the opposite of that. What we found is that invaded plots had high earthworm biomass, but when you remove garlic mustard, earthworm 
biomass actually goes down to the level of the uninvaded reference plots, which suggests that possibly garlic mustard is facilitating earthworm invasion in some way. So from a management perspective, um, what we can say here is that eradicating garlic mustard may also have the added benefit of helping to reduce exotic earthworm density. So just to summarize here, the below ground effects from these big eradication experiments that we've been able to document so far is that there's changes in the mycorrhizal fungal community, but there is some overall recovery of mycorrhizal groups. There are reduced soil um, pathogen loading and reduced earthworm biomass in response to the eradications. However, key fungal species are not restored and the physical properties of the soil itself are not restored. So garlic mustard is leaving a signature on the below ground um, biota and on the below ground physical properties where it invades. So moving on to some above ground effects of garlic mustard, in addition to declines in the tree seedlings that I showed you earlier, we are also finding low densities um, of some native species in areas that are invaded by garlic mustard. So erythronium and myanthemum popped out as two species that are fairly sensitive to garlic mustard. So in areas without garlic mustard, both of these species occur at higher densities than in areas with garlic mustard. <coughs> But when we did the eradication experiment, those species did not rebound. So here's myanthemum canadensis shown in purple in the uninvaded plots. And then there's no difference in the other colors from the invaded, pulled, and sprayed plots, indicating that there's really no change in, um, in myanthemum densities along with a number of other native species in response to this eradication treatment. We also saw no, no effect of eradication on native plant diversity overall. In fact, native plant diversity was similar at all of our plots, including the uninvaded plots. So pulling out garlic mustard is really not an effective thing to do if biodiversity is your main management goal, because there is really no effect on native plant diversity at all. And there's really no change in overall native plant abundance with eradication either. We see a lot higher abundances of native plants, not surprisingly, in these uninvaded plots. But when you pull out garlic mustard, you do not get a rebound in, in the above ground abundances of native plant species. So that makes us take a step back and wonder what's going on. Why aren't the plants responding to eradication the way that the fungi are responding to eradication? And this is sort of a funny graph to look at. This is an ordination plot, and without going through all the details of how this is created, the way that you look at a graph like this is you look at a clustering of similar colors. These different colors represent the different sites where we did the eradications, and the clusters represent species composition of the plant community. And what, we've, what the take home messages from this is that the sites are showing a clustering of plant community structure. So black rock forest up here, shown in red, has a different plant community structure than questing forest out in the Berkshires over here, and so on. And so what that makes us think about is that, huh, so maybe one of the reasons that we're not showing this overall change in abundances of native plants with eradication is that the sites themselves are so different from one another. And what this really suggests is that it's important to maybe have some site-to-site um, comparisons and to have some site-specific types of management planning put in place to look at whether or not there's recovery of plant communities on the time scale that we're looking at um, in terms of overall plant species composition. And I'll show one more of these coordination graphs. The way that you look at this graph is to compare the cluster shapes and the spatial um, variation in terms of where these clusters sort themselves out on these axes in terms of color. So once again, the colors represent the different sites, but now we're looking at invaded, pulled, sprayed, and uninvaded. And so getting back to my, my point about site specificity, the way in which an invaded patch compares to a pulled patch and compares to a sprayed patch for, different, for each of the different colors varies somewhat from site to site. 
So again, that, rec that suggests to us that there's site specificity in terms of overall plant species composition, and so therefore it's hard to pick up sort of broader geographic patterns in terms of how garlic mustard is affecting these plant communities and whether and how eradication can lead to restoration. The other thing to keep in mind, though, is that these many of these understory plant species are long-lived species, and some of them also have dispersal limitation. So it is also possible that there's just simply a lag period that we have not reached yet. But so we're able to say that within the six years that we've been doing these eradications, we know that there has been no response. It's possible that it may just take longer than we have been able to look at this. So then just to summarize the above ground effects, from these eradication studies, adult garlic mustard densities decline with pulling, much better than with spraying. Spring ephemerals, and we had a conversation at dinner about myanthum canadense um, being more of an early perennial species. They do not recover when you do eradications of garlic mustard, um, nor do native diversity and abundance. Um, but rather, these plant communities are site-specific, and so there may be either this lag change in the trajectory of the rebound of the plant community, and that leads to the um, question of whether or not it might be better to do site-specific planning in terms of managing this. So I'm going to move now into the next part of the talk, and this will be a shorter part of the talk, but I want to point out some long-term observations of the invasion process of exactly how it is that garlic mustard gets into the forest understory um, and how it has become this invasive species and what that might mean for us in terms of effectively managing it. So one of the things that we've done is to conduct a presence and absence survey of garlic mustard in two types of habitats, forest edge and forest understory. And shown here is a graph just showing whether or not garlic mustard appeared in the forest understory in two different ecoregions, the Connecticut River Valley and the Berkshire Valley in Massachusetts. So anything you see here that is a white circle means that garlic mustard was absent. So in this presence absence survey, um, we surveyed over 250 sites and we found that garlic mustard was much more abundant in the Berkshire Valley than it is in the Connecticut River Valley. Then these um, circles that are filled in show that garlic mustard was present, but only at the edge, not in the forest understory. So you can see that that occurred as well, but then present with incursion into the understory was much more um, common in the Berkshire Valley than in the Connecticut River. <coughs> and we think that that has something to do with habitat fragmentation and um, the more um, Rich, disturbed, the rich and less disturbed soils in the Berkshire Valley, which makes it more habitable to garlic mustard, whereas there is a different kind of land use history and not as rich soils in the Connecticut River Valley. So I think that that may be what's going on there. And um, land use explained invasion in the Connecticut River Valley, but not in the Berkshire Valley. So, Another thing we've been doing is monitoring garlic mustard within the Connecticut River Valley in a forest where it has been present but not particularly invasive for quite some time. And this is at the Harvard Forest. There are three observation sites that we've been monitoring since 2003. And we've been looking at this in three different microhabitat types. The edge, the forest edge where it's open and sunny, these intermediate zones that are sort of the transition zone be between the edge and the forest understory and then the intact forest itself. And all of the things we've measured, adult height, the number of fruits produced per plant, the branches per plant, and so on, all of these are higher, showing that there's much greater vigor and larger plant size in the forest edge than in the other two microhabitats. And the same is true for seed production. <coughs> the vast majority of seeds, garlic mustard, are being produced in these edge populations compared to these other two microhabitats. And that is true not only back in 2004, but also true in 2016. So that is a long-term pattern that is consistent. And when we then model population growth based on the performance of these um, plants in these different microhabitats, we see that uh, population growth is positive. In other words, the populations, each plant is replacing itself more than once 
in all of these microhabitats back in 2003 to 2005. And that continues to be true for the edge and the intermediate habitats in 2015 and 2016. The only populations that are decreasing were the forest populations in the more recent study. And so that, taken together, suggests that there's this edge to understory demographic happening whereby the sources of seeds are primarily these edge populations and these sources of seeds are then feeding some potential sink populations such as those in the forest understory. So in this particular site, and I, and I emphasize this particular site because this may not be occurring in, in <coughs> other sites, but in this particular site it appears that these edge populations are the source populations and that the uh, forest understory populations are demographic sinks. So what this suggests is that eradicating garlic mustard at the forest edge will just by default help eradicate the understory populations and that management might be most effective in it if it is concentrated at the, at the forest edge. Okay, and then I'm finally just going to touch on uh, another experiment where we looked at the interactions between garlic mustard and global change factors. And this is a, a big experiment that is also happening at the Harvard Forest. This is a long-term experiment known as the SWAN experiment, which stands for soil warming and nitrogen addition. And we added a garlic mustard treatment to this big experiment. And you can see here this sort of checkerboard effect that is um, achieved in the forest understory in the wintertime. What's going on here in these experiments is that there are underground cables that are warming the soil to, um, to five degrees above ambient temperatures. And so we have a heated treatment that is accomplished by heating the soil. There's also a nitrogen addition treatment that is mimicking um, the nitrogen deposition pollution rates that are expected in the future at 50 kilograms per hectare per year, and then a combination of heated and nitrogen. All together, um, within this forest, a number of different replicates for each of these different treatments, and then the control plots that are not undergoing any of these treatments. And you can see the heated plots melt the snow off. Um, you can see these little checkerboard things that are achieved by the heating of the soil and um, the melting of the snow. And so what we did is within each of these, we added a garlic mustard invasion treatment. And then we planted red maple seedlings, which we know are sensitive to garlic mustard, into these subplots that have had garlic mustard in addition to all of these other treatments to look at the interactions between the biological component of global change, that is the, the invasion by garlic mustard, and these abiotic factors. And what we found out here is that, um, well, as it turns out, red maples really like to be warm. And so when you look at the soil warming treatment, red maples just go, woo, and they just grow. And they have lots of colonization of their roots by our muscular mycorrhizal fungi. They get really big roots. They also get really big above ground. And um, that was not so much the case. It was to some extent, but not as dramatically so in the other treatments. And then, when you compare the uninvaded to the invaded treatments within each of these, you can see that garlic mustard reduces mycorrhizal colonization of the roots, but dramatically so in these warmed plots. So the takeaway message from that is that even though red maples really like to be warm, if you invade red maple um, seedlings with garlic mustard, they're still going to have major suppression of mycorrhizal fungi, and they're still not going to grow very well. So altogether, what we have sort of put together is this framework for the ecology and impacts of garlic mustard thus far. We know that its proliferation in edge habitats in its home range is also leading to net dispersal into forest habitat, and that is um, one explanation for why it has become so abundant in the forest understory, as well as its phytochemical disruption of mycorrhizae which is also thought to help facilitate its invasion into these habitats. We're beginning to see changes in forest composition and ecosystem function as a result of this invasion at the whole community level. Um, and we are um, still looking to see what eradication, how eradication may be effective in terms of restoration, particularly of the plant community. 
And then new research in my lab is going to be looking more at the future expansion of garlic mustard and um, in particular the responses of garlic mustard physiologically to things like global warming and nitrogen deposition. And then just in case you thought garlic mustard was the only one that can do this fancy stuff, um, I just want to mention another component of my research program, which is looking at another non-native mustard, mustard Flaspi orvinci. Flaspi orvinci was introduced during the mining days into Colorado and um, is invasive in these high altitude meadows that have not historically experienced plant invasions of any kind. And we know that the phytochemistry of Flaspi orvinci is dominated by the compound synagrin. Synagrin is the same, that is the same compound that dominates garlic mustard. So we are now beginning to look to see if Flaspi orvinci has similar impacts on soil biota um, as garlic mustard does in northeastern forests. The other thing that we already know about Flaspi orvinci is that it mimics the host plant of native butterflies. And the native butterflies in this ecosystem see Flaspi and oviposit on Flaspi, but the larvae do not um, make it past pupation. So it becomes an ecological trap for the native butterflies that mistake it for its host plant. So we're continuing to look at synagrin levels across this altitudinal gradient um, to determine what are the what is the ecology and impacts of this other invasive mustard. We're also comparing it to some of the native mustards like Flaspi Montana, now known as Noxea Montana, which is a native mustard very similar to it and um, really asking questions about what happens when these non-native mustards enter these high altitude ecosystems. So I did bring copies of our newest um, pamphlet, which is uh, the sort of a summary of the latest and greatest findings and management recommendations that sort of bring together the management angle from the, the science that I've just talked about. Here, so if anybody would like a copy of that, it's available on our website, um, but it's also available here in person if you'd like a copy to take home with you today. And with that, I'll take any questions. Yes? I have so many questions, but I don't want to hog the time here. So first question is, had you thought of taking a native woodland species like 2 mm -hmm. and looked at that as a way to compare it to the garlic mustard and say, you know, is this inhibiting the growth of mycorrhizal things where the toothwort grows in the forest floor? Right, that's a really good question. And, and toothwort is an, an interesting example um, because it's one of the few species that is native that is breast casey that you would find in the forest understory. The thing about toothwort, though, is it never occurs at the densities that you see garlic mustard occurring you know, here, and in terms of, you know, at the invasion scale. Um, so, yes, I've thought about doing that, and that's something that we will do in the Flaspy system, um, but we haven't done that with garlic mustard. The web address? Thank you. This one? No, it's copied. There you go, sure. Yeah. Thank you. I'll keep going if nobody else is coming. All right, so um, you had a slide that had a date up there, 1860, and I want to explain to people here what that date is, and that is this off-reported <coughs> date when garlic mustard supposedly first arrived in the United States, Yes. and it supposedly arrived in Long Island, but I keep hearing this story that settlers brought garlic mustard to the United States and Long Island was settled way before 1860. And my strong, strong suspicion is that garlic mustard arrived way earlier, possibly as early as the 1600s. And perhaps the 1860 date is like the first Barchard or Barium specimen. That's exactly like what that, that is. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly what that is. And I've heard that anecdote too, that, yeah. that the settlers brought it over in yeah. hay, and that may be how it actually got introduced. Yeah. Okay. So there was a question back here. The seeds can survive a long time in the seed bank, up to 10 years as far as we know. Yeah. Has, has anyone kind of done control efforts over that period of time to literally eradicate it? Well, so about 90% of the seeds germinate in the first year, but then some do persist. But yes, so when we're doing our eradications, I should clarify that when we, when we do 
do the eradications, we go back every spring and there are always seedlings. So we go back and pull out the seedlings again. So it, it does, it is a tedious process. Yes, Aaron. Just, just to um, this we, we try to do that in a fairly concentrated patch in Royal School where we pull it every spring. And after about eight, nine years, it was basically nothing. But it was a small, it was just a very local patch under one apple tree and in the, you know, at the forest edge. And we could do that, you know, we had a, a, an area, but if we missed one, you'd know it the next year because there'd be a whole other little group out there. Yeah, because sometimes one plant can produce up to a thousand seeds. But I think, I think the interesting thing about doing that was that and it speaks to your results, was that we do this and it was just bare ground after that. And you pull up and you think, okay, so three years from now we'll get some red maple seedlings or something coming up, and it was just nothing. And so the long-term toxicity in the soil is really there. And so, you know, we, we got rid of the garlic mustard, but then we had, well, I have a, I have a area I have a follow-up question on that, though. All right, so I'm wondering if we know that for sure, or do we know that it seems to have an adverse impact on seed germination? But did you deliberately plant native plants in the plots where you move the garlic mustard and then see what happens? Right. No, we did not do that okay. in this case. No, Only we just, we just watched. Yeah. I know, but there's. I, I can tell you places where they'll take an area of woods and they'll put a deer exclosure around it. And you don't see this immediate, you know, eruption of native species growing there. It looks just like the area outside where the deer is still eating. So I don't think it really tells you necessarily. I, that, I do that's agree that could be not true. <laughs> All right, well, we can, we can fight about that. But in the meantime, though, I think it's important for us to plant natives in the area where garlic mustard is removed. Yes. And then we'll know whether it's yeah. the seed inhibition or whether it's actually hurting natives that are put in there. Sure, except for the, the one study that I just showed you where we did the global warming experiment, we did plant native tree seedlings into areas that had garlic mustard for just one year and then it was eradicated and within that year the, the um, red maple seedlings were planted and there was virtually no colonization of the roots by mycorrhizae and really, really suppressed growth. So that's the one case where I can say we've tried. Did you have a question also? You know, I was going to ask how the uh, the chemical effect it has. Is that how how does that occur? Is it something that exudes through the roots? Is it just from decaying plants? Yeah, that's a great question, and we're trying to work that out with Blaspi in much more detail um, than we have been able to do with garlic mustard so far. But we think it's a combination of root exudation as well as the leaf litter. And is it something you can measure? Like, can you detect the levels of those chemicals in the soil? And in your first experiment, you were talking about actually crushing the plant up. Right. Painting it on or growing things. Right, so making like a garlic mustard tea. Yeah, which is presumably a very concentrated version of what you get yes. naturally, I guess. Yes, and Can so. You detect the chemicals you, you, It's very difficult to detect glucosinolates in the soil just because you have to run it through an HPLC machine, and doing that with soil is not, not a method that I know how to do. You can measure the glucosinolate content in the leaves, though, and in the litter, and in the roots. And so we're doing that in, in great detail. Um, okay. You can do that in, we're, we're beginning to do that in great detail with last year, Vente, I have a PhD student working on exactly where in the plant are the glucosinolates being produced. Yeah. Yeah. Has, has any work been done in Europe to see if there are any there? Yes, so we actually did an experiment like that. I didn't show the results here, but we, we did an experiment with a large number of native plants from Europe and a large number of native plants from North America. and. It's funny that you mentioned germination because one of the things that we find is that garlic mustard suppresses germination of native pl of not of native plants in North America, but not native plants in its home range. Mm -hmm. And similarly, it has no effect on the soil biota in the home range, mm -hmm. but it has a, a remarkable effect on mycorrhizal fungi within the invaded range. So we think that that may be a story of sort of long-term coexistence and resistance 
um, in both the plant and the, and the soil biota. Yeah. There was a question in the back. That was exactly my question. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. I, I was actually uh, doing that if, if you have any data uh, about it behaving in its native range. Mm -hmm. like, you know that the native plants are not behaving. Right, so, so in its home range, it's really restricted to these edge type of habitats and it doesn't occur in forest understory at all. It doesn't. It doesn't abuse any other uh, surrounding plants. Yeah, and, and in so far as we know, there's no impact of garlic mustard within its home range on the other on the native plants. Yeah. Is there a genotype difference? So, so the one in North America, is there? What's the sort of genetic variability here versus here? So, so there's been one study looking at the genetic variation um, across the eastern seaboard and it suggests that there were multiple introductions and that there's a lot of ge genetic variation even in North America. Yes. Okay, I want to share two stories of uh, some woods out in, uh, in Lee Mass where I've seen garlic mustard in that woods. Yeah. And this is a woods that um, uh, did not have garlic mustard in it at all until the dirt bikes came in. Mm. And yeah. so, um, and then I saw it sprouting up all along the trails, mm -hmm. only along the trails, nowhere else in the woods, but yeah. just where the trails were. So that was apparently how the garlic mustard got in. And then uh, it spread beyond there and infiltrated the entire forest floor. And then the next year it was completely gone from everywhere, mm -hmm. including along the trails. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and so I don't know if this is your forest thing, that it's a sink and eventually it dies out in the forest or, or what. Then the other thing is um, there is a practice, which you probably know about, of people going to the woods and digging up wild big sally and trichocum ramps. This is something that I've advised against because it's not sustainable for ramps, number one. And I said that if you leave any bare soil behind, you're creating this ideal opportunity for the garlic mustard mm -hmm. to get in and establish a toehold in these beautiful rich woods places mm -hmm. where the wild leeks grow and then you know there go all our spring ephemeral wildflowers. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure so so the one thing that I would say about the dirt bike story is that um, because garlic mustard is biennial, it's hard to see it in year two. You often get, especially in a very early in a, in a very uh, young invasion, you often get these really strong pulses of adult plants, and then they all they produce all their seeds, and then all seedlings the next year, and then more adults, and then mostly seedlings, and then until the seed bank starts to even that out, you, you get this very strong sort of um, fluctuation in adult versus seedling density. So it may be that it was there, but you didn't see it because it was seedlings only. Um, but it's also possible that it, that it didn't, that that population didn't So mentioning that pulse, that sort of um, represents what you were seeing with the spray plots in the beginning at the first slide that you were showing yes. on that, where you had every other year you had high numbers within your spray plots versus... Yes, yes, that's right. So the sprayed and the invaded plots showed that same pattern with year one, high adult density, and then seedling densities increased dramatically the following year. So I was only showing adults in that picture. Yep. I think with that, we can uh, go next door for some refreshments and. Uh